This is Masters in Business with Barry Ritholtz on Bloomberg Radio. This week on the podcast, what can I say? Michael Lewis, author of so many amazing books, starting with Liar's Poker, which just celebrated its 30-something anniversary, and the audio rights reverted back to Lewis. We have a fascinating conversation uh, about that, about expertise, about his podcast. Really, uh, what can you say? Michael Lewis is just a a one of a kind. Everything he does is just absolutely fascinating. I really enjoyed this conversation, and I think you will also. With no further ado, my interview with Michael Lewis. This is Masters in Business with Barry Ritholtz on Bloomberg Radio. My extra special guest this week. You know him, you love him, you've read all of his books. Best-selling author, Michael Lewis. He has written so many seminal books, so many seminal tomes on Wall Street from Liar's Poker, The New New Thing, uh, The Big Short, uh, Flash Boys, uh, The Premonition, on and on and on it goes. Uh, He is out with season three of his podcast, Against the Rules, and he also created a series of short uh, discussions about Liar's Poker, which celebrated its 30th anniversary right before the pandemic. You can get that either as an audio book, the print book, or listen to the audio companion that he's put out on Other People's Money. Michael Lewis, welcome back to Bloomberg. Good to hear your voice. Same here, same here. So for for the people who may not be familiar with you, let, let's just do a brief background. You graduate from Princeton and you head to Wall Street to make your fortune, where you are pretty much rejected by everybody, uh, most notably Lehman Brothers. Tell us a little bit about that experience. <laughs> well, I was a, at that point, I was a senior at Princeton, and everybody was showing up on odd days of school wearing a suit and going to the career services office and interviewing with Wall Street firms, because that's just what you did. And so this is, what, 1981, 82? Uh, um, and it was it was kind of a new thing that you know half the class of Princeton wanted to go to Wall Street, um, but half the class of Princeton wanted to go to Wall Street. So I thought, well, I must want to go to Wall Street too. <laughs> and I rolled into a few of those interviews, one with Lehman Brothers, uh, not even knowing really what Wall Street was, and um, I didn't really understand why I was supposed to know what Wall Street was. But it, but it, it was humiliating, you know. Uh, like, do you know the difference between a stock and a bond? No, I'm happy to learn, kind of thing. And, and uh, but, but so I, I was doing it not, I really, I kind of, it's not, it's probably too strong to say it was a lark, but I just didn't have anything better to do. So I thought, what the hell, I'll go, go to these interviews. And it was only later, so what, three years later, after I've done a master's at the London School of Economics, that I really accidentally fall into a job at Solomon Brothers. Um, and- and just so to flesh was, this out, at, at Princeton, you're not taking economics or business courses. You I was an art history major. <laughs> yeah, no, I was an art history major. But that, that didn't stop anybody. I mean, it, it was, I mean, the, that's the beginning of the world we're still kind of living in today. I mean, I have a daughter who's a junior in college, and, you know, a third of her class wants to go work in financial services. Where in financial services is a little different. Back then, it really was very bank-centric. It was Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, Lehman Brothers, Solomon Brothers, and so on. Uh, but, in, but it was, I mean, it was strange, right? I mean, it, everybody just takes it for granted now. You don't grow up learning the difference between a stock and a bond. Uh, you don't grow up knowing what a difference between a commercial banker and an investment banker. That was a question that you had to have the answer to if you were interviewing for investment banks, because they really needed to be flattered that you knew the difference that investment bankers were like, you know, they were alpha, alpha dogs and the commercial bankers were nobodies. Uh, you need to be able to explain that difference. So you did this, I can remember kind of cribbing for the thing, getting the cliff notes from a friend who really cared about it. Like, if they, what are they going to ask me, and what do I got to say? And it was like, well, if they ask you about the difference between investment bankers and commercial bankers, you tell them that investment bankers drive Ferraris and, and commercial bankers drive Fords kind of thing. <laughs> and and, uh, and it was, it, but, but it, was, it was so, I mean, shallow. I, it, was as, it was as shallow as having 
a quick conversation with a friend and then ducking into an interview with Lehman Brothers to see if I could get away with it. Um, and it wasn't any genuine interest. I, cause you, how could it be genuine interest? You had no idea what they did. Now, my insight was that this was true of the other, you know, 700 people in my class who were applying for these jobs, too, that nobody knew what they did, or almost nobody knew what they did. So everybody wanted to do it, even though they didn't know what it was. I found it really ironic that you got rejected by Lehman Brothers, who then come back into your life with the uh, the big short. <laughs> well, I never really made that. I didn't feel deeply embittered by being injected. What bothered me about the Lehman Brothers interview and is in Liar's Poker, and I feel this to the day, is that there were two people interviewing me, and one of them was a young woman I really liked, who was two years ahead of me at Princeton. And we were like pals on the Princeton campus, and she knew me well, pretty well. And when I get into the interview, it's like she's a different person. She's like, we've never met, and if I don't know, if I can't talk intelligently about stocks and bonds, she's giving me a cold stare. And she created a really chilly environment. And I thought, this is strange. It's strange to do that with someone who you probably know well enough already to evaluate whether this person is going to fit in or not fit in or be able to do the job or not do the job or, you know, has anything going on between their ears or, do, or do, doesn't. And it, she, it was this really artificial thing. She was in one of those, at the time, the suits that women wore with a big bow, little puffy bow tie. And, uh, and I just thought it's just it's just it's just a really uncomfortable, socially uncomfortable. Huh. And so, I, I did pick up, I don't know, probably every kid picks this up when they're moving from school life to work life, just um, how, how, how artificial work life can be, how artificial it can seem. Uh, and and that, was, that was my first brush with it, and it was really un- unsettling. I can, I can imagine. So, so you, you don't get by Lehman Brothers, but eventually, through a crazy story you tell in Liar's Poker, you end up at what actually is the hottest firm in the world, Solomon Brothers. How soon after you arrived at Solly did you realize this is a really unusual place? Well, I'll tell you. i tell you two stories, and you can decide which one is true, because I actually don't remember. <laughs> but um, the first story is I told myself, I thought I told myself, look, I know I want to be a writer, but no one's paying me to be a writer, and or really. And, you know, I can get $90 an article writing for The Economist or The Wall Street Journal op-ed page, or, or I can go take this job for huge piles of money. I can make some money and then figure out how to be a writer. I think that's what was on my mind. And, but, but, but I walked in, I knew even before I walked into the place that it was a really interesting place. I mean, it was, if you just go back and look at how much at Solomon's Profits, compared to the rest of Wall Street in, say, 1983, 84, they made, it was like they made more money than the, all the rest of Wall Street. Like, it, it was just, you were, they were clearly in some other business. Even if you didn't know what it was, you'd say, something weird is going on here. The, and I the, get there, and yeah. it's raucous. I mean, it's crazy. The, the training program is a frat house. The, the, the trading floor is an even better frat house. It's, it's, it's intellectually stimulating. It's actually the... the the, the, the false kind of presentation of Wall Street at the time was that these investment bankers, the people in the investment banking department, start out as analysts and become associates and work their way up to vice presidents. And they're, always, they're meeting with CEOs and they're doing the M&A transaction and all that. That that's where the actual intellectual life was. That if you were a really good student, that's where you went. And if you were like just had greasy elbows, you went to the trading floor. The truth was that the real intellectual work was being done on the trading floor. It was pricing these, figuring out how to price and value and, and trade these, all, these new complicated securities. And it was riveting. And, and, and also understanding how global markets were working. I mean, just, just there were all these new markets opening up everywhere and their relationships. It was far more intellectually stimulating than, than the stuffy stuff that was going on inside of the offices of the investment bankers. So instantly, it's like, wow, people are wild here. And wow, it's actually intellectually interesting. So that the training class, which goes on for five months or wherever it was, 
was was one of the best courses I've ever had in anything. It was absolutely riveting. And, and I sat there taking notes and asking questions and feeling like I was getting the world's best survey course in how the financial system worked. Um, so I was, so the second story, so the first story is I'm going to go make some money and then figure out how to be a writer. The second story, and you can decide whether this rings true or not, I have a friend who was in that training class, that first training class that I was in. Um, his name was Keenan Damon. And he was an earnest young guy from, I think, Minnesota. And I, I never met him. I sat down next to him the first day of class, he says, and he, and he says, I sat down and I said, hey, uh, who are you and what are you here for? And he said, I'm Keenan Damon and I'm here because I want to sell mortgage bonds and this is the place to sell mortgage bonds, which I thought was strange because how would anyone know they wanted to sell mortgage bonds? But anyway, uh, and he said, he said to me, who are you and what are you here for? And according to him, I said, I'm Michael Lewis and I'm here to write a book. Uh, now, I can't believe I would have said that the, you know, the first day of class at Solomon Brothers, but it is possible that I was already thinking this material is so good that this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to spend a few years here and write a book about it. But it was messy because I was kind of like, I got very engaged with it for a while. Yeah. If you'd asked me a year in what I was going to do, I probably would have said I was going to stay five years. So, so you also kept a, um, a diary while in, during your days at Solomon Brothers. That, that might suggest that you had a book on the mind. When did you start keeping that diary? Yeah, I'm not really a diary keeper, so that's true. If I was, I, and I was keeping a diary. Diary's a little strong. It wasn't like, uh, you know, I'm sad today because and, and, my, my best friend said something mean to me. I didn't do it. None of that stuff. It was, I was just recording what I saw and, um, and my thoughts about what I saw. And by the, and, and, and by the, I mean, I do remember that by the crash of 1987, uh, when I, just by chance, was wandering around the, the New York trading floor. I worked in London, but I'd been flown back to New York. And it, all, all hell was breaking loose. I, were, I wandered around with a notebook out, just writing everything down. Uh, and I knew that I was going to write about this at that point. And I left three months later. But I, I think that what I was doing was going, I was, I was still writing while I was there. I was going home at night and trying to publish, write magazine articles. So I think at the same time, I was just kind of, kind of keeping a record in my computer of what I was seeing. And it, so that does suggest that at some point, I realized this was material for me. Huh. So, so you touch on so many things I have to ask. First, good trade leaving Sally three months after the 87 crash. Was that, was that good timing? Well, the timing wasn't to the crash. The timing right. was to my bonus, which landed in the bank account at the end of January of 88. So I had to hold my breath until that money hit. Um, at the end of 87, I already had a book contract. Huh. I didn't sign it, but so I'd, already had, I'd already sold an idea for a book. And gone in, and it, so at the end of January, I went and told my employers that I was leaving. It's good trade. Um, well, if my literary career hadn't worked out, it would have been <laughs> catastrophic. Uh, I was... I was, it looked anyway, like I was going to make a lot of money at Solomon Brothers. I was paid, you know, they told me I was going to make a lot of money. Um, and I tell you, there was a really funny moment. And this tells you sort of something about the spirit of the, that moment, which is very different from now. It's hard for people to believe that you would think, right, anybody who's in like Goldman Sachs now would think, there's no way I can like walk out of Goldman Sachs and write a book about what I just saw at Goldman Sachs. They're going to sue me. I will have signed all these non-disclosure right. agreements. I'll be discredited every which way. Actually, uh, there were no non-disclosure agreements at Solomon Brothers. There was, I, I to, when I told the bosses I was leaving, they took me, they took, these were very senior people, they took me into a room. And I told them I was leaving, I was going to write a book about Wall Street. I didn't know what the book was going to look like exactly, but I said, I'm going to go write a book about Wall Street. They didn't say, oh, like, what's in the book and don't write about us. Not, that was, like, furthest from their minds. They were worried about my mental health. They were sincerely <laughs> worried. It was really sweet. If you were there, you'd just be thinking, these people really care about this young man. They really thought, they said, look, you just made whatever, a quarter of a million dollars. You're probably going to make twice that next year. They actually said, now, this is probably BS, but they did say, we think you're someone who might run the firm one day. <laughs> and, and I was just like, wow, you know, this is so nice of them to care so much. Um, 
And they, and it was like, they just said, just don't do this. Like they said, wait 10 years, wait five years, you get rich and then go write your books, which is also what my father said. And, uh, and I said to them, I, you know, I just can't, I, I just feel like I got to do this thing. And it was, but it was a really sweet departure conversation. And they, they were just worried. They thought I was insane. So at the moment, it looked like in the moment, it looked like a totally insane trade. But, but you know, when you're 27 years old and you are full of passion and you think you know what you want to do, I think you really, I think it's smart to honor those feelings. Right, and that's a time to take risks. I yeah. really had a, I mean, I had a head of steam. I had no real justification for thinking that I was going to be a big success as a writer, but I had a head of steam. So, so there are two points I have to anna, uh, sort of annotate what you said. First, I think it's fair to say that Liar's Poker is, to some large degree, why Goldman Sachs has non-disclosure agreements. You kind of... <laughs> You kind of force that on the rest of the street. Uh, I think that's pretty fair, right? So I, I I ruined it for everybody. You you did. So hey, listen, someone has to break the glass ceiling, and, and then secondly, they usually end up on the bottom of the sea in concrete shoes. But yeah, right. But secondly, you had already published a column at the Wall Street Journal while you were working at Sally that got you into trouble. That had the most hilarious resolution. Tell us about the compromise that was reached when you published under your own name. So this, you have to, there's a tiny bit of backstory you need here. It was, so I was writing while I was there, and things would get into print. And maybe a year and a half into my journey there, um, I published an article in the op-ed page of the Wall Street Journal arguing that investment bankers were overpaid. And it said at the bottom, Michael Lewis is an associate at Solomon Brothers in London. And um, and I thought, no, so this actually gets to, you, you, you really kind of can't believe the spirit of the thing, but I remember exactly how I felt. I was so excited I was in the Wall Street Journal. I thought when I came in the next day, like people would be slapping me on the back going, wow, you got a piece of the journal, all that. I thought, I thought like everybody could be happy for me. And I roll in to the London office the next morning, and Charlie McFay, who I adored, who ran the whole of Solomon Brothers International, and had been the one who hired me, was waiting at my desk, ashen-faced, and he hadn't slept. And he said, we've had meetings with, like, the board of directors overnight about your piece, uh, because it's being re- it's apparently going to be reprinted all over the country, and people are talking about it, and clients are calling. And he said, he said, you can't. I mean, my God, you've created a crisis. And now you would think, oh, Michael, you're fired there is the next line. But actually, they, this is the backstory. I was in a very odd position. I, I had, at that point, the, maybe the second or third biggest customer of the whole firm who would speak only to me. Uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a proto hedge fund in London. Jacob Rothschild was the, was the firm. But, and the guy who ran the money there, um, thought it was amusing because I, I, I acknowledged to him how little I knew. He said, well, nobody knows anything. You aren't going to at least try to sell me stuff. As long as you don't try to sell me stuff, he said, I'll do my business through you. And he made me like the most successful salesman in, 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 in the London office overnight. He was just channeling a huge volume through me and would refuse to like speak with anyone else at the firm, including John Goodfriend, the chairman, when he would show up in London. He'd say, I only talk to Michael. <laughs> so I had this situation where that guy, he was probably generating $10 million of profits for Solomon Brothers. Wow. They weren't going to fire me because of him. And so it was sort of like, how do we deal with this problem? And the boss of, all, of the bosses was sitting there at my desk, and he said, I said, I'm not stopping writing. I, I, that's, you know, I'm made to do this. I'm going to do it. And he said, all right. He said, could we do, could you do it under, could you leave us out of it? I said, yeah, I'm sorry about that. And he said, he said, uh, he said could you use another name? And I said, well, how about if I use my mother's maiden name? I don't know why that popped in my head, but it, my mother's maiden name was Diana Bleeker Monroe. And Diana Bleeker Monroe wrote several pieces, <laughs> a couple for the New Republic, a couple for a magazine in London, and about, and, and I'm still using the material around me. It was just disguised. And, um, and I would come, the couple times the New Republic ran pieces, I'd come into the office 
or the evening they'd come out kind of thing. If someone would fax them over to the London office, they would be reprinted a thousand times and all over the desks, and no one knew it was me who wrote them. Oh, and they were, so everybody was reading them. So I had market testing for this stuff before I wrote Liar's Poker. I knew that people thought what I was writing about Wall Street was kind of funny huh. and like on point. Uh, but that's that. So I had a little literary career rolling alongside my my career on the Solomon trading floor and, because of this conversation with this guy. So, so um, not a total leap of faith. You had an idea. Hey, I, I have some traction as as a writer. I just, you know, it seemed to me when I published the couple of things I published that were about Wall Street that everybody on Wall Street wanted to read them. And I wasn't thinking, I didn't know how big the audience was exactly, but I thought that was a good sign. Huh, really interesting. Season three of Against the Rules just dropped. Season one was about umpires and all the interesting things they go through and how umpiring has changed. Season two was about coaching. Tell us a little bit about season three and experts. Why did you choose experts as a topic? Well, so the idea is to pick some role in American life. So referees or coaches is very broadly defined, like referees, also regulators, for example, um, or, or, you know, art connoisseurs, people who are making, making calls about things. And with experts, I, and the, the, the key to the role is that it be important and that it be a little volatile. And you're asking the question, like, what's happened to this role? And there are a couple of things about experts that got me into it. Well, one, I mean, just to hook it up to the to liars poker, I, I have been bewildered by people's willingness to accept other people as experts since I was on Wall Street, but when I was on the phone selling stuff to people. And professional investors would take what I said seriously when I knew I didn't know what I was talking about, that I, because I was at Solomon Brothers, I was the expert. And so I got, I got, so I think my interest actually dates back to that, to the, just how, how, how fuzzy the whole concept is. And then of course, like my whole literary career is based on finding true, the best experts. I mean, I, it's one way of looking at all the books. I find, I find people who actually know what's going on, who you might not think are the people who know what's going on. Certainly true of the big short money ball. I mean, it happens over and over. Premonition. And premonition, exactly. It's, 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 it's surprising where you find the expert. I have found over and over again, and it's often not the high-status people. It's often people who are buried away and no one knows who they are. And so I wind up writing whole books about people, characters that the world thinks are, in the beginning at least, obscure, until they make the movie about them. Uh, but they are obscure to begin with. And, and, but they're, they shouldn't be because they are the one who actually knows, say, how you value a baseball player or how you should manage a pandemic or what's going on, on in, sub, in, in subprime mortgages in 2006. Um, and so I, I think that's another source of interest. Um, but, but, so that's got, that got me into it. But there are all these questions that just seemed really worth exploring, starting with, like, the pandemic. Um, before the pandemic, the United States was like judged to be by far the most expert in managing pandemics of all countries on earth by, in, in, a, in a survey that had been done. And, you know, a year into it, we have, we have 4% of the world's population and 20% of the world's deaths. We clearly didn't, whatever that expertise was, it didn't quite work. And I, I kind of look at the world, and I think over and over, our country, I think over and over again, we're demonstrating this very strange ability to generate expertise, to generate knowledge, and not use it, or not understand it, or not identify it, or not respect it. So, um, so that gets me in. And, and the nature of the podcast is different from what you and I are doing, right? I mean, right. these are, I'm writing film scripts. Scripts, Every right, episode exactly. is, a, is, is, I mean, it's a pain in the ass. It's... <laughs> Every episode is... is it's work. Uh, it's, it's work. What you do is work. This everyone, is easy. It's like everyone takes me about as long as a long magazine article takes. Wow. I interview a whole bunch of people and try to make sense of, of some aspect of this problem and try to tell it as a story. And, um, and so the seven episodes, each one is a, a different story. And um, uh, I mean, like the one that dropped this week, to, uh, just give you just to give an idea of how it works. Uh, one that dropped this week 
is an attempt to make a kind of argument in story um, about why, about this paradox. And the paradox is there are all these fields where you can see expertise has improved, where the experts are getting better and better, but where people trust them less and less or think they're, actually think they're more, they're wrong, or think less and less of them. So medicine is a really good example. Nurses and doctors will tell you that for the last, you know, 15 years, they've felt they're, they're clearly more likely to help you than they were, you know, every day they're learning stuff. And, uh, and yet every day the people who walk in their office are more likely to be armed with something from like WebMD they read that says the doctor doesn't know what he's talking about. And, um, but, but you know, really, that, so that's a complicated example, but a really simple example that's kind of fun. Uh, talk to a really old weatherman, someone uh-huh. who's been a meteorologist on TV for the last, say, 50 years, as we did. And they'll tell you that, um, look, 50 years ago, my forecast is basically sticking, sticking my head out the window and seeing what the weather was. That, that I, yeah, I could kind of do a kind of okay two- or three-day forecast. My 10-day forecast was just as good as guessing. And no better. And I certainly couldn't tell you like where tor- when tornadoes were going to happen and where they were going to hit. He, they can do all this stuff now. They can be very precise about extreme weather. Their ten day forecasts are pretty good. Their three day forecasts are multiples more accurate than they used to be. But they used. To, but they'll also say we used to get on TV and speak with total certainty, like Ron Burgundy. We were like puffed up, important, confident people. Now we speak because we understand. The, we really understand things. We're kind of talking in terms of probabilities and uncertainties, right. and we're expressing uncertainty. And the audience, the way the audience has responded is you know, like to doubt them more. Uh, that it's sort, and so the, the, the podcast is about how people don't really think probabilistically. And, huh. and if you give them, if you tell them there's a, a 20% chance of rain and it rains, they think you don't know what you're talking about. They don't understand what that means. And so I think so much modern expertise, one answer to the question, why the expertise is getting better and better and why people understand it less and less, is in the nature of the expertise. The expertise is, very, is probabilistic and data-based. And it's, it's a, you know, in grand historic terms, data is a relatively new phenomenon. And people really don't understand when Nate Silver says, you know, Hillary Clinton has a 77% chance of beating Donald Trump. And Trump wins, they think Nate Silver doesn't know what he's talking about. What they should say is, wow, Nate Silver was actually a little more bullish on Trump than all the people on TV. And right. the, in his models, Trump won almost three out of ten times. So, it, it, it's, it's, um, it's, so it's exploring this phenomenon, this, this problem people have with, prob- with experts who talk in terms of probabilities. And, and you and I discussed this when we did the podcast after the Undoing Project, that if someone goes on TV and says something bold with a lot of confidence, they're believed more by the audience than the person who comes out and says, well, you know, there's a 60% chance this could happen and there's a probability that can happen. They're perceived as wishy-washy. Not, not only does the person who expresses certainty, usually stupidly, um, get believed, they're much more likely to be on TV. When the TV producer calls you up, if you say maybe this and maybe that, they just don't invite you on TV. TV wants you to come on and be certain uh, and bold and interesting. Uh, so it's, um, it, it is, it's screwy how we don't – we should respect experts who express doubt. It's even in their own understanding of the world, far more than experts who seem really confident. Uh, that, that should be like a that should be the bias, not the opposite. Right. That makes um, a- and instead, we re- we reward this phony certainty, this phony confidence. We think we think it is, we think it reflects a deep understanding. We sort of we sort of get bluffed all the time at the poker table. Huh. Um, That's in, interesting. Instead of realizing that this is a bluff, and-, um, and the person, of course, oftentimes the person who is expressing total certainty thinks they're right. It isn't that they're lying. It's that they actually. They actually, they know they know they know little enough about what they're talking about to sound certain about it. <laughs> Often wrong, never in doubt. Often the, wrong, never in doubt. The, there is um, a, a quote of yours from I don't remember if it was the first or second episode of the season about how challenging it is to find the experts, and, and the line that you use is, "Your job is to find the L six 
explain what the L6 is. And and this I specifically is the person who ends up saving thousands of lives via the Coast Guard because he changes the way we look for missing boaters. So those are, you're conflating two episodes here. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, the L six the L six episode is about a woman a woman who figures out how to get money out of insurance companies. Oh, that's office. right, the uh, medical bill. But, but you know what? The, it's tr- also true that the guy in the Coast Guard is an L six. Uh, six and L six is six levels down in the organization. And it, this is an insight that I first heard from an entrepreneur named Todd Park. And Todd Park had um, has created, I think, three different multi-billion dollar companies in the healthcare industry. And in addition, he was chief technology officer for the United States in the Obama administration. And Todd Park said to me, and the story we tell in the first episode is his first company. And it's the story of he's trying to create um, a, a business where he makes pregnancy less dangerous, more pleasant for women, and, and cuts the cost of catastrophic outcomes by basically caring for the mom better and buys a pregnancy clinic in San Diego, and it's a catastrophe because, it's a catastrophe because one, the insurers won't pay him to make pregnancy more pleasant, and two, the clinic itself isn't getting paid for the work it's doing. And he realizes that the problem he really needs to solve is medical billing, that all around the country, the insurance industry has gotten so complicated in how it responds to doctors' claims that doctors aren't getting paid. And he finds buried in a basement in a hospital in Boston, this woman who has mastered the complexity, the thousands of different insurance programs and the thousands of different permutations on the programs, and has just got a gift for getting paid, uh, knowing how to handle the complexity. Her name's Sue Henderson. And he realizes that, like, on the org chart of the hospital, she's six levels down, but without her, the hospital goes bankrupt. And the hospital itself doesn't, fig- doesn't understand why its business is working. And Todd extrapolates from this and realizes that in big systems, in big corporations, in big agencies, in government, that, that when there is a crisis, when there is a problem, and you're looking for the expertise to solve the problem, to answer the question, it's never at the top of the organization. It's always some, someone low in the organization who has some specific knowledge. And when you have... When you have uh, 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 an, an, uh, a hierarchical organization, not a flat organization, that knowledge, the expertise, has unbelievable difficulty in finding its way into the decision maker's hands. Um, and so Todd sets out to kind of build a career on this insight. And they're really spectacular results he gets. He gets called in when, when Obamacare fails on the first day, when the website crashes, and it's, a, it's like one of, the, one of the catastrophes of the Obama presidency, right? He goes all the trouble of getting, it, getting the thing passed, and, and now the website crashes. Todd is, I think at that point, CTO of the country, and he knows. Don't ask the people who are on top. Go, go, go six levels down and ask who understands how this software works. And he finally finds six levels down contractors for the government who, uh, who can solve the problem. But over and over, he finds that, that you've got to go to these people. And so it, it, it raises like this bigger issue about expertise, I think. Um, when you live in a society that's more or less equal, where, where the person six levels down is not all that far away in status from the person right. at the top, in pay, in the way that people look at them, in their sense of self-importance, there's a freer flow of conversation information. It's easier for the L6 to get what they know into the head of the L1. But when you live, live, live in an increasingly unequal society where the CEO is being paid $30 million and the L6 is being paid 50000 and is regarded as you know, an interchangeable part, um, it's harder. And I think that part of our problem in unearthing expertise is a problem of inequality. Um, but we, that, that, we get at that only elliptically. The, the story of this woman kind of coming in, a completely un- unknown, unsung person, and her, what's in her head going into software and creating a multi-billion dollar company called Athena Health is a spectacular story. And, and so that, that's the first episode of the, of the season. So, so now you're, you're almost done with season three. How do you like uh, the sort of scripted podcast format 
that you're doing, it, it seems a whole lot more collaborative than sitting alone and, and typing in your, your office at home. It's a perfect palate cleanser, cleanser between books because it does a couple things. It, it is collaborative. It does work different muscles because you're writing for the ear rather than the eye. And the ear is a more, it's a more, it's got a, it's, it, it's got a different emotional palate than the eye. It really responds differently to emotion. Uh, you, hear, you, you hear the emotion in people's voices. It rewards emotion. Um, and so I, I like being pulled in that direction uh, for the podcast. I love, I love the storytelling challenge of writing these scripts. I think it's just really useful for me. It's just, a, it's a different, it's, it's, um, it's in some ways looser, some ways tighter than what happens with, a, with when I'm writing a book. But it's, it is cross-training. It's like working different muscles. So I really like doing them. I wouldn't want to just do them. Uh, I think alternating between books and podcast seasons is a really good thing, is really good for me, really mm-hmm. healthy. Uh, a year ago, or barely a year ago, you released The Premonition, a pandemic story, which was all about America's history with pandemics and how well prepared we were for the coronavirus. So so it's been uh, a year since the book has come out and, and probably two years since you first sat down to start writing it. Uh, how do you think it's held up in the ensuing decades? <laughs> Well, it was a story that was designed to hold up in this way, that I knew that it, it ended in May of, 2000, of 2020. So it, it ended once it was clear that the United States had screwed up its response uh, and that most of what comes before is characters kind of showing you why the response was going to be screwed up. So in that, and, and, and so it, it didn't depend. It didn't depend on anything after that. It really is. It was it, the story was kind of over when I wrote it, which sounds strange because the pandemic's not over. Um, the um, I'm disappointed with the, the 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 effect of the book in that I thought. I'd watch the big short have a very big effect. I don't know if it was exactly the right effect, but I, I thought that there was such an obvious response to the stories. It wasn't, you know, what I was saying, what the characters were saying, who were clearly the people among the people we should have been listening to going into the pandemic. Uh, and that they were saying that the, the CDC has ceased to do what, it, what you think it does. It does not control disease. It, it, it observes and re- reports on disease. It's not set up to be battlefield command in right. a pandemic. And so the first thing you do is create, is create something new that does respond uh, to a pandemic. And you acknowledge this isn't what goes on in the CDC. And instead, the Senate's trying to pour more money into, into the CDC. Uh, that surprised me. I thought, I thought the book might stop such stuff from happening. So I'm kind of disappointed. I'm kind of disappointed in that. Um, the second, and I'm kind of, this isn't, uh, the fault of the book, but it's the, it's it's a curious aspect of our society. That one of the things the book points out that I find riveting. One of the characters had gone back. You know, uh, it, this was now 15 years ago. He'd gone back and looked at what happened in 1918, in the 1918 pandemic, and realized that the people then, at the end of their pandemic, hadn't fully understand what had actually happened that they, di- they didn't understand in particular that the things they had done to slow disease and prevent death, like closing churches and schools and saloons, the social distancing stuff, wearing masks, had actually really worked and explained differences in death rates between cities in, in America. And they, hadn't, they, hadn't, they just thought, well, there were deaths everywhere. It's hard to see the effects of these things. They didn't have the data, whatever. Um, but they hadn't really done a post-mortem that enabled them to be prepared if it happened again, like what worked and what didn't. And it seemed to me, I described that what this guy does in some, at some length, it seems to me like a natural thing for us to be doing now, right. and we're not doing it. Uh, and I, can, I, can't, I can't quite believe it. I mean, I can't believe that no one's asking why the death rate in Miami is, is, is three and a half times the death rate in San Francisco, or, or why the death rate in... In, in the red counties out here in California that 
didn't comply with public health orders right. is double or triple the death rate in the blue counties that did. You know, I, 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 it, may, it may not be that the social distancing worked. There may be some other explanation, but we need to know it because there were really different outcomes from place to place. And, it's, and I think we need to understand why. So, so let's bring this back to our previous conversation about experts. It seems that the pandemic has led to even greater mistrust for experts, or am I saying that backwards? Did the pandemic reveal a mistrust that was already there? You know, what it revealed was an L6 problem. Right. Um, that, the, the, that there was so little honest concern about pandemics for such a long time that we had shoved the, that the role, the actual job of controlling communicable disease, of preventing disease from moving from person to person, had been shoved down on local public health officers who had very, and it, who had very little social clout, poorly paid, no one knew who they were, uh, you know, uh, uh, not important people. And so they, you know, if you want to find expertise in actually controlling communicable disease, you go inside your really, which you, nobody does, inside your local public health office. And you talk to the local public health officer who handled the measles outbreak at the school or, or, or the, you know, drug, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis outbreak in the bad neighborhood. You know, it's, it's, um, they've been doing this and they have been very aware of the political consequences of trying to constrain people's movements and very aware of how you actually stop people from getting sick and dying. And they've been, they've been fighting battles. So this war breaks out. And to this day, we have not acknowledged to those of the people who should be in front of the Senate talking about it or, or on a commission writing up a plan for the country. It isn't kind of grand poobahs who are floating around Washington. It's people at the local level who, who we should surface as the experts. And they were the experts going in, and they got slaughtered because they didn't have the social authority. They, they, you know, and what's happened is in various states around the country, their, their legal authority is being dialed back, which I think is a catastrophe. Yeah. I think you, that, 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 that removing the authority from the expert to do what needs to be done if there's a disease outbreak in your neighborhood is really a bad idea. To leave it in the hands of politicians is really a bad idea. Well, let's talk about one of those local experts who you surfaced. Um, Charity Dean is one of the key characters in the book. I actually got to interview her at a conference last week in, of all places, Miami, since she mentioned it. And she is saying that given the BA2 uh, Omicron variant that's starting to show up both in uh, hospitals and in, in waste treatment um, plants, which she believes we should be checking lots and lots more of, She's looking for a surge in, in May and June. Tell us a little bit about how you found Charity Dean. Yeah, the, the Charity Dean was a, is a wonderful character because she dramatizes the, the central problem is just how brave you have to be as a local public health officer to really do your job well. Nobody should have to be as brave as she had to be. And um, she, I, but I found, how I found her is kind of funny. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic... I thought I should be looking into this as a subject and, but because I, the book before the premonition was The Fifth Risk. It was about go, how the government manages or doesn't manage or, uh, uh, existential risks, how the federal government, how the tools we have at the federal level have been allowed to decay and ossify. And, so, so, and what were the consequences of that? Well, here this existential risk pop, pops up, and I think, well, it's an example of kind of what I was writing about. Let's see, let's see if there's a story here. And uh, Charity was the last character I found of the main characters. And every other main character, um, Joe DeRisi, a prominent, viral, a prominent um, virus hunter, basically, at UCSF, um, a group of doctors, they called themselves the Wolverines, who had written the U.S. pandemic plan. Um, uh, various people all said to me, Look, if you want to get to the guts of this, you've got to meet Charity Dean because we've met her and she knows more, more about like how to actually manage this in the middle, of, you know, in the fog of war than anybody. But Charity Dean herself was an L six. 
She was buried inside the state of California Health Department, and she wasn't even running it. She was, she was actually exactly six levels down from Gavin Newsom huh. and, and was being, in January of 2020, forbidden from using the word pandemic <laughs> but, and banned from the meetings where they were discussing what would happen if this, was, if this thing that was happening in China was actually serious. She had already figured out it was very serious and was already thinking about strategies to deal with it. And she was being excluded from the conversations that, that were happening in California for the first couple of months of the thing. And, um, and so I wrote her, I have an email somewhere, where I wrote to the Department of Public Health in like, oh, I don't know, May, April or May, and said, I really want to interview Charity Dean. And I, and I got a note back saying she doesn't want to, she's, she's unable to talk to you, I'm afraid that that's not going to happen. And it wasn't from her. So I put it to one side. I thought, well, that's too bad. She didn't want to talk to me. And then I, but it, got, it annoyed me. And like a month later, I managed to get her cell phone, and I texted her. And she said, they never sent me. They never asked me. They never told me that you would call. I'm happy to talk to you. And, uh, and thus began a, this, uh, I mean, an exploration of a character who I would argue might be the best character I have ever had for any book. Um, just spectacular, and huh. and who took you to to the nub of the problem in our pandemic response? Um, and I tell you what, among the other things that has surprised that surprised me about writing the premonition, when you go and spend time with someone who is a local public health officer, just ask them to tell you stories from their day uh, or, or their career. It is so dramatic. I mean, it's, it's guns and violence and scary stuff and people dying of disease and squirrely doctors who are who with dirty needles who are giving people hepatitis. It's, it's, it's one drama after another. And I couldn't figure out why no one had done the TV show. I mean, it was just the material was so good. I thought, it, and it was, it was naturally dramatic, naturally anecdotal material. I couldn't figure out why we didn't know about these people. Um, it, was, it was an arbitrage. It was like finding a. It was like finding a stock no one's paid attention to, um, and she was the stock, uh, and I went along, <laughs> to say the very least. Yeah. Last last premonition question. We're recording this two days after a Trump appointed judge who the ABA described as not qualified uh, overturned the CDC mass mandates. What what are your thoughts on this? I think what the judge is, was effectively saying, I didn't read, I, I need to go read the you know, 60-page decision, but um, I glanced at it. Uh, the, is that, that's the, that the Congress, not the CDC, has the power to do this, and it's sort of a version of what's happened at the, lo- at the state and local level across the country, that the, the political process and it's the it's the right wing uh, removing the authority from the public health expert to do public health. I think it's really a really bad idea. However inept the CDC has been um, for for sort of these sort of federal decisions, they really you know until we get something better, they, they kind of need to be the expert who's making the call on this, not not Repu- not a Congress. Uh, and I think um, effectively what, what's, what, what's happened is she's killed a lot of people. Um, she's doing this just as there is a rise in the number of cases. She's making, she's making public trends. I, I don't want to wear a mask. So you're talking to someone. Me neither, like, but. Half of my brain says, God, it'd be great. I don't have to wear a mask on an airplane anymore. I'm not at risk. I got, I'm vaccinated. I'm healthy. I'm nothing, I don't have any. I'm none of the, I'm not, none of the risk buckets. So, who, yeah, great. I don't have to wear a mask. That's You're over 60, aren't that. you? You, you my, actually do have a risk bucket because 60 plus is a comorbidity. Yeah, but I'm 61 with the body of a 30-year-old. So, <laughs> so, so I actually don't think I'm in the risk bucket. So, and, so you feel... And, 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 it's, it's, um, and so I, I just, I don't, I don't, I, I, my, so I really, my first reaction is that, wow, great. Thank God I don't have to wear my mask. But the second reaction is, this is really bad public policy. <laughs> this is like, if you're just looking at what's going to happen because of this, and, and uh, it, I mean, I just, it's a shame. It's a shame. It's a shame, and I think that, that vulnerable people will pay the price. And what I, but this gets back to the question of, 
we need a post-mortem to, 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 at the end of this to show why people died where they died and, and, like what, and why they were saved where they were saved. Not for, ret- for purposes of retribution, not for purposes of blaming this judge for people dying because they caught it on an airplane, uh, but for purposes of going forward into the next one. We're not, we're not using this as a learning experience. We're using it as an arguing experience, and it, that, it is such a shame because it's going to happen again. Cherry's right. I think Cherry's right about this. I mean, all my characters, they say, look, this feels anomalous. This feels once every century. But actually, the last 20 years, these, the, these things have been jumping from animals to people right. at a greater rate. And there's a reason. Our relationship with nature is broken. And, and we're watching the result of that. Uh, and it, it's, there's no reason to think it's not going to keep happening. So we need to learn. We really, really need to learn. Our experts need to learn. And you're not learning if you're not asking honestly why things happened. Huh. Really, really, really fascinating. When the audio rights for Liar's Poker reverted back, you decided to make a complete audio recording of the book. I just reread it for the first time since the mid 90s. Tell us what your experience was rereading your own work. Unsettling. I- I, I just I don't reread my books. I, sometimes I feel like I should, and I pick them up and I read the first sentence, and I go, I can't do this. And I, I did that with Liars Poker. I remember, and right on the paperback tour, a year after it came out, I thought I got to go read it to remember what's in it, and I couldn't even do it. Um, so this really is the first time I've reread it, and I thought a couple things were instantly obvious. One, I was in the hands of an amateur, um, and, and I could actually hear one form the amateurism took was the prose is infected by the voices of whoever's book I was reading while I was writing it. So at one point I was reading some George Orwell and other Mark Twain or, or Tom Wolfe or Rebecca West. Or I can remember what I was reading at the time because I can hear their voices in my prose. And, that's, and it's a pale imitation of their voices, but I could see that the voice was wavering in, in the book, and particularly early in the book. Yes. And not the first chapter, because I wrote the first chapter last, but, but when you start at chapter two, you're seeing me in the beginning of my career. And it's kind of interesting. It's not till I get to about, I can't, there's a passage in like chapter eight where I thought, huh, I'm liberated. This is actually more me. I recognize this. And it's subtle, but it was watching. It's sort of like I was, I, I don't advise anybody to do this. I was learning how to write a book by writing a book. And, um, and you can see it in the pages of the book. So that surprised me. Um, the other let me, thing let was, me jump in here because I just have to tell you, I had the same experience rereading this in that it's clear in the beginning it's not truly, you hadn't discovered your voice yet, but towards the 60% mark or so, and I read this on a Kindle, which I normally, I prefer hard paper, but... um. I noticed that where you start talking about the mistakes that Solomon Brothers management made, like the beginning of the end of Solomon Brothers, you're, you're becoming Michael Lewis in that you're making these broad observations about other people's judgment errors, and your voice really rings true there. And my own judgment errors. I mean, I, I think yes. the, moment I, the moment I first recognized, really recognized myself on the page is... Um, an eight-page or ten-page story where I, it's the first time I rip off a customer. And I, I don't, I'm so stupid, I don't know I'm ripping them off. I think that the trader has just given me a smart thing to do. And, um, and that, that's the first time I thought, oh, God, this works. I wouldn't actually change this. And this feels like me. Uh, so that's, you know, that's, um, it was, so that, so that was the first takeaway, was it was just, I was, I, I was, figuring out how to trust myself as I was writing the book. And I came to trust myself eventually. Uh, so that for, that's observation number one. Observation number two um, was how much the financial world had changed yep. since then. That I, I remember thinking, as I was reading, I was thinking, God, I was so lucky that people actually shouted at each other and threw telephones at each other and, and, and were actually doing trades face-to-face. Um, because that's, you know, without that, the book just has no life. And I, you walk into a trading floor or a hedge fund now, and it's just like silence. Uh, it's like people staring at screens and tapping away and 
algos are doing the trades. And it, I would be very hard to make it interesting now, a, as it was. It just, I think it was just a more lively place. But, but there was, the, the but was you could see the seeds of what Wall Street is now in what Wall Street was becoming then. Uh, that the, the, there are big macro things happening, and they're happening in the book that are big changes, and starting with, like, half the class at Princeton wants to go work on Wall Street. Uh, these changes that are happening in the culture uh, that are happening right then. And so in that way, there was a current, there was still some currency to it. Um, that, was the, that was the other reaction. I had so, lots of other little reactions. So, the, main, so, <laughs> the main little reaction was, and this is like a rule, is that it, it was when I thought I was being funny, I, can, I wasn't funny. And the stuff that was funny, I didn't realize was funny. Uh, when I was, I was laughing, when I was rereading my book, I was laughing in places where I didn't laugh when I wrote it. And I wasn't laughing in places where I did laugh where I wrote it. Huh. So, so let me share one thought with you that I, didn't, I couldn't have picked up in, in 94 or 96 whenever I read it the first time. But, but it was very clear this time um, not just that Salman Brothers was was formative to Liars Poker, but Liars Poker very much foreshadowed your future books. the The whole discussion of of how mortgage bonds were developed and other the IOPO bonds and other sort of things sort of uh, presaged the big short. There, there's conversations about. Geeks and experts being ignored, presaging Moneyball and Premonition. There's even some discussions about uh, the computer guys coming in and they're still ignored, but eventually that's Flash Boys. Am, am, am I wildly overstating this, or are there seeds of, of your future books present in 1989? Well, there's no question that the big short is presaged in, in the mortgage, all the stuff about the mortgage market that's going on. I mean... Louis Ranieri himself, the guy who right. who created the mortgage securities market, uh, when when the 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 financial crisis happens, blames himself. I don't think that's fair. It's like it's like it's like Dr. Frankenstein blaming himself for what the monster became. Uh, but it's uh, he it's um, he saw the connection. So that's there's an obvious connection between the innovation that occurred while I was at Solomon Brothers and the disaster that ensued 20 years later. Um, the intellectualization of finance, um, is, there is a connection between that and the intellectualization of sports. Um, you know, first, the, I mean, I would, there's probably a great story in the undergraduate physics program at MIT. And if you go back 40 years, I bet like they all become physicists. And if you go back 30 years, a few of them are trickling onto Wall Street. Right. Uh, and you go there now, and it's sort of like they either go to Wall Street or they go into sports. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it's, it's interesting how we've, or, or maybe Silicon Valley, how we have channeled that kind of intellect into enterprises that previously didn't see a need for it by complicating those enterprises. And, you know, first finance got very complicated, and then sports got very complicated. Huh, really, really interesting. Um, tell us uh, what was the law of the jungle, which runs through the book so much. I always thought of it as, as you know, kill or be killed, which you know, very much is, is a factor here. But, but Solomon Brothers was a little unique in, in the way they managed that, and you point out later in the book how they allowed their biggest, best, most profitable traders to leave after they were no longer a partnership. And, you know, these guys are traders and they made the trade to, you know, to hit the bid and join Goldman or, or Morgan Stanley or somewhere else where they or Merrill Lynch, where they would be paid millions more than the few hundred thousand they were getting plus a bonus at Solly. Yeah, there was an odd contradiction in the Solomon management theory. Um, John Goodfriend would say things like, um, "You got to get if you're going to come work here, you have to be you have to wake up in the morning willing to bite the ass off a bear," or he'd say, 
Nobody here is going to get stabbed in the back. People are going to come at you through the front door with a hatchet. Uh, <laughs> that he encouraged this red and tooth and claw free for all on the trading floor where er- everybody kind of for himself, all for the firm sort of thing. And um, at the same time, he, after he sold the firm, and so there was not the partnership stake right. to yoke people to the firm, um, he expected total loyalty and fealty from these killers who he had encouraged. And that, that they weren't to, if they were being paid $300,000 of Solomon Brothers and Merrill Lynch offered him a million, it would have been, it was, it was regarded as treason to take the million. And that was crazy, that you couldn't have both. Um, so it, he, he, he sort of encouraged the very qualities that led people to look out for themselves and respond to market incentives rather than to other kinds of incentives like loyalty to the firm, um, and and didn't see the contradiction. Uh, and it it really cost him. I mean, he had virtual monopolies in markets that he just let slip away by letting traders go. And of course, they wouldn't have been able to preserve the monopoly. Eventually, they would have lost their grip on the mortgage market or on the arbitrage trading or whatever it was that they had an edge. But they had kept it for some more time, and and while they had it, it was so valuable. So it was it was it was it was an odd situation. Um, and the whole firm, the whole firm, <laughs> knew it was mismanaged while I was there. I mean, down to the lowest geek, everybody knew. Whatever they thought about Good Fund personally, they realized that the thing was just not managed well, and they couldn't quite understand why it was managed the way it was managed. But the effect for me was a really smoothly managed firm is much less fun to write about <laughs> than the total chaos. This is total chaos. Yeah. So the, the chaos that I got to write about was much more fun. So, I, I, I mean, in some ways, I'm forever in John Goodfriend's debt uh, because, because he, he created an environment that was a literary goldmine. To, to say the very least. Last question before we get to our speed round, and that is... Throughout the book, because Solly was a bond shop, there's a lot of talk about debt, government debt, consumer debt, mortgage debt, America's borrowers, and and all what an evil this is, how it will eventually weaken the dollar and cause all sorts of economic mischief. But it's three decades later, and it's other than the financial crisis, which was very specific and not traditional debt-driven, we really haven't seen a lot of the, the bad things come to pass from all that debt. What's your assessment of that era? Did everybody just repeat the same things and more or less got it wrong? Well, yes. Part of what was going on is it's such a departure from American historic, historical American finance uh, that it was, I mean, the people who said this is all going to be fine have been proved right so far. I think that there's still another shoe to drop, and maybe it's dropping now. I mean, eventually, you you can't live beyond your means forever, and um, and the financial crisis was in some ways, a well, a lot of ways, a byproduct of this American uh, willingness to to live well beyond its means, um, and using and using debt to do it. Um, the, the machine, I mean, the crucial ingredients, the crucial parts of this that enable this machine to function are things like the dollar as a reserve currency around the world, right. which we're putting at risk. Or, um, I mean, it's, it's so I, 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 not compl- I know I'm not completely answering your question. Did people kind of get it wrong back then? I don't, I don't. I mean, I think people would. If you go back and talk to Henry Kaufman way right. back in 1983 or 85, I think he probably would say that. I'm surprised by what happened. Uh, I would have thought that I wouldn't have thought the federal government would be able to run the deficits it's been running for as long as it's been running it. I wouldn't have thought the American consumer would get away with what the American consumer got away with in the run-up to the to uh, the financial crisis. But and it's not going to end well, he would say. But it still I, hasn't ended. I mean, we're still kind of in this period. So um, the, the the period, the Great American Debt Explosion. Uh, so. I have to point out that each of your books led to a subsequent expansion of American debt. You had 
Liars Poker and, and the big debt explosion we saw in the 80s and 90s. Uh, the big short, look at look at how the Fed expanded their yep. barrel, balance sheet. Yep. And then the pandemic. So I'm not suggesting that I'm causation. <laughs> right. But, but you're talking every time you describe one of these big issues in a book, it's often because the result of that issue was a huge expansion of debt. Yeah, it's true. So, so I know I have a hard stop with you, so let me in the last two minutes jump to our speed round and ask our favorite questions. Five questions, 90 seconds on the clock. Let, let's get this started. What are you streaming these days? Tell us what's keeping you uh, entertained. Well, oddly, I'm streaming uh, a preview of the six-part Netflix series called The G Word, which is based on The Fifth Risk. So I am just started watching my own television show. I didn't make it. Adam Conover made it, the comedian, but um, I'm watching that. When, when does that come out on Netflix? When can the rest of us stream that? End of May. All right, looking forward to that. So so you, uh, in in the new podcast in, in um, season three, you kind of um, reveal some of your mentors. Tell us a little bit about Dash Rip Rock and Alexander and the human piranha. Um. I actually go back and talk to these pseudonymous characters, and they reveal themselves in the podcast. Um, it's it's kind of where they are now that's interesting, because you can see where they were then in the book. But the human piranha, who was ferocious on the Solomon trading floor, has mellowed into just a sweet guy uh, who is em- emotionally intelligent. He's just he's transformed in some ways. Um, Dash Riprock spent his career, he made up, he, uh, he, up until very recently, was in the bond markets and has watched, essentially he says, the death of the American bond salesman. He's watched his career, his, his occupation just more or less vanish. Uh, and Alexander uh, left Solomon Brothers, had a, uh, blew, up, blew up at a hedge fund, um, and has had a kind of interesting career as a private investor and lives in Singapore. Um, so they, they, they're, they, they've all, they've all kind of mellowed, uh, and they all, I think they, I think it's probably fair to say, like everybody in my training class, all the people who stand on wall street anyway, they all made more money than me. (laughs) Uh, That I don't doubt. Um, give us two books that you've read, either a, a longtime favorite or what you're reading right now. I've got two novels that I'm starting, and I'm going to re- I'm reading. I shouldn't do this, but I'm about to do it. Uh, I'll read at the same time. Uh, one is uh, a novel called Horse by Geraldine Brooks, who is an old friend and, and is like a really great writer, and it's so much fun when one of your friends is actually a great writer. Um, and, so, and that actually isn't out yet. That comes out next month. So I'm reading galleys of that book, and I just picked up at the same time um, a, a book about my hometown, a novel set in my hometown by a writer I don't know. Uh, the book's called The Yellow House, set in New Orleans. I think it won the Pulitzer Prize of the National Book Award. Sarah Broom is the name of the author. And it's a, it's a, it's a view of New Orleans that is very different from the New Orleans I grew up in. It's, 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 um, it's black New Orleans rather than white New Orleans. And that always interests me. So, so you have said that uh, Liar's Poker had a very different impact on the world than you expected, and people requested advice of you uh, after the book came out or thought the book was a how-to guide. What sort of advice would you give today to a recent college grad who is interested in a career on Wall Street? Um, ask why you're interested first. It, it, and go talk to people who are 20 years older than you who kind of remind you of how you, who kind of look like they might have been like you when they were your age, and see what you think of their lives. Uh, Because they're really great ways to have careers on Wall Street, and they're really bad ways to have careers on Wall Street. And people go in for the wrong reasons, for obvious reasons. Um, The other thing I'd say is, figure out whether whether you're a, a a career person, a job person, or a calling person. That if you need a calling as opposed to a job, um, uh, you can find it on Wall Street, but it's much more likely you got a job that pays real well. Huh. And you're going to be really frustrated with your life if you spend it in a job when what you really need is a calling. 
All right, final question. What do you know about the world of either investing or writing today? You wish you knew when you first sat down to write Liar's Poker 32 years ago. This is damning. Uh, I don't think I've actually learned anything about investing in the last 32 years. It's of all, at all useful. I think that sort of like all the useful things are really simple, and I pick those up by doing the opposite back then with other people's money. Um, uh, writing, you know, I'll give you one simple answer. It, 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 and it's, I think the best things I've done are because I've got the best characters. That I think that I underestimated the importance of character early on in my writing career. And I've, I've gotten better and better at, at, at identifying characters who are really good and, let, and writing them. So I think that leading with character is what I've learned. We have been speaking with Michael Lewis, author of such seminal books as Moneyball, The Big Short, and Liar's Poker. If you enjoy this conversation, be sure and check out any of our previous 398 prior discussions. You can find those wherever you get your podcasts. We love your comments, feedback, and suggestions. Write to us at mibpodcast at bloomberg.net. Check out my daily reads at ritholtz.com. Follow me on Twitter at ritholtz. I would be remiss if I did not thank the crack team who helps put these conversations together each week. Justin Noliner is my audio engineer. Atika Valbrun is my project manager. Paris Wald is my producer. Sean Russo is my research director. I'm Barry Ritholtz. You've been listening to Masters in Business on Bloomberg Radio.